Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Doing well? Yeah? You alive? Yeah? All right. Well, hey, my name's Justin. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Bridgeway, and I'm excited to be a part of this series called Pure Gold, uh, where we do a couple different things. But before we get to that, I want to kind of remind us of what we heard last week, because last week, Pastor Ron gave us a great intro into this series by talking about Judges 3.16 and the story of King Eglon and Ehud. And I'm telling you, if you have not listened to it or seen it, you got to go back and watch it because Ron does such a great job of using that story and, and finding this unique connection between that story and the verse of John 3.16. And that is exactly what we're doing in this series, is we're taking a look at some of the other 316s in the Bible, if you will, and seeing how they connect back with John 316 and support John 316 as one of the most recognized passages in all of Scripture. And so John 316 is this. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so last week, Ron brought up a couple of different examples of how John 3.16 has really permeated our culture. And one of the examples that he brought up was the fact that Tim Tebow, a football player, uh, wrote John 3.16 in his eye black uh, right before his football games. And so he'd be playing his football games with John 3.16 basically written across his face. And I, I wanted to do this. I wanted to take that example and I wanted to take it one step further because there's even a deeper connection that Tim Tebow had with the verse and the passage in John 3.16. And so interestingly enough, in the year 2012, which was about three years after he first started writing John 3.16 in his eye black, Tim Tebow and the Denver Broncos were playing my Pittsburgh Steelers in the first round of the NFL playoffs. And it's crazy because in that game, the connection between Tim Tebow and John 3.16, like I said, became even deeper. And here's, here's where it happened. So essentially, if you don't know, in that game, a few different things happened. One of those things is, the, is that the Broncos miraculously, as the underdog, beat my Pittsburgh Steelers. But in the midst of that, some crazy stuff went down. You see... Tim Tebow in that game with John 3.16, you know, written on his cleats and on his eye black, in his eye black, he threw for 316 yards in that game. Not only did he th throw for 316 yards, but he passed for 30, uh, 31.6 yards per completion. On top of that, TV ratings for the game were at 31.6%. Meaning that of all the people who had their TVs on that night, 31.6% of them were watching this game. And not even that, on top of that, a pivotal interception in the game that led to a Denver Broncos field goal, that interception happened when the Steelers started with a third and 16. I mean, it was third down and 16 yards to go. Craziness. I even heard this. I even heard that Tim Tebow does 316 push-ups every third hour and 16th minute on March 16th every year. I made that last part up, completely made up. But the rest of that story is all still true. Unfortunately for me, even the fact that the Broncos beat my Steelers in the playoffs that year. But John 316 it certainly has, has shown up across the board in our culture, hasn't it? Like we see it everywhere. In fact, as a matter of fact, it's even printed on some fast food stuff. It, it's, it's printed on the inside bottom rim of every cup of everybody's favorite West Coast fast food joint called In-N-Out Burger. On top of that, you'll even see it uh, in the clothing store Forever 21 that you see in a lot of malls. They have John 3.16 printed on the bottom of every bag that they sell in there. And so John 3.16 just continues to be a big part of our culture, whether people even recognize it or not. And so this morning, church, what I want to do is I want to dive back into another 316 in the Bible, and I want to give us that passage right off the bat today. So we're going to open up to the Gospel of Matthew this morning. 
And so if you have your Bibles with you, you see one of the Bibles in the seat backs in front of you or down below the seat, you can grab that, open up. It's the first gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, first gospel in the New Testament. And we're going to open up to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3, and we're going to look at verses 13 to 17 this morning. Otherwise, you can also follow along on the screens behind me. And so Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17, says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, And Jesus saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And so there's a few things, there's more than a few things that really stick out to me in this passage, but there's a few things that I love about this passage. Because to me, when I read this story of of Jesus' baptism, I'm reminded of the fact that Jesus is the perfect example. That not only did God give the world Jesus as a humble savior and sacrifice, but that he gave the world Jesus as a perfect model. That throughout his life, Jesus is modeling for us what it looks like to have a life full of faith discipline and action when it comes to pursuing God and all that it entails. You see, every word, every action, every interaction, and every characteristic of Jesus is an example for all of us, all of it. Because Jesus is the perfect model for us. And that's what's mind-blowing to me. That's what's mind-blowing to me about this passage is that, is that through this perfect image of God in Jesus, Jesus' humility is constant. In this case, in this passage, he insists that he's not above being baptized by John. And so you have the Son of God, the Messiah, stepping into baptism himself as a model of what pursuing God looks like once you've already made a decision for salvation. And so, church, I say this next part not as a guilt trip, but as biblical truth and reality, that if you've already made the decision for salvation and you're wondering what the next step is, here it is. It's baptism. Whether you made a decision for Jesus yesterday Or you made a decision for Jesus 20 years ago, baptism is a step of faith that Jesus, the Son of God himself, knew was important. And it's a decision that Jesus boldly and yet humbly stepped into. Not because he had to, he's the Son of God after all, right? But because he chose to. And it's the same for us. Maybe, maybe you're sitting out there this morning and, and you know that you've hemmed and hawed over the thought of finally getting baptized because of this reason or that reason. And I want to challenge you this morning to look at baptism differently. Because baptism isn't a have to, it's a get to. And instead of viewing baptism as a hurdle, I believe we should view it as what it is a public declaration of your faith that professes this, it professes that Jesus is Lord and that I'm not ashamed to follow him with my life. In fact, I'm I'm willing to make it public that this is who I am, Christ in me, because Jesus has changed me. Listen, if if that's you this morning and you've been at that crossroads, I encourage you to to be a part of our baptism experience and opportunity that we've got coming up in the fall. And I don't say that this morning to sell you on anything. I'm not trying to 
to just like have this huge spike in numbers that sign up for baptism or anything like that. I don't, I'm not trying to sell anything. I say that because I know some of you need to know that the opportunity is here and we want to celebrate Jesus' role in your life with you. Maybe you've been waiting for the perfect moment and yet Jesus says, come as you are. See, everything doesn't need to be wrapped up in a perfect bow in your life in order to get baptized. See, that's not what baptism is about. If you're waiting for the right time, if you tell yourself that you're waiting for the right time to be baptized, that time may never be right. Maybe the time is now. But here's the deal, though. Because this message this morning isn't just for people who haven't been baptized. There's more to this passage, I think, than, than just baptism. You see, one of, the, one of the most interesting aspects of this passage for me is the fact that John tries to deter Jesus. But he does so in humility, right? Like we see that, that John, he's, he's not just trying to deter Jesus because he thinks he knows better, but but he also, he's trying to do it in humili- out of humility, in a, in a, hey, Jesus, I'm not worthy of baptizing you type of way. But he nonetheless tries to convince Jesus that it should be the other way around, that maybe Jesus has it backwards. And yet Jesus insists that he must do this, that he must get baptized himself to fulfill all righteousness, I find this interesting, the the, the Greek word for baptize, the Greek word is baptismo, baptizo, which means this, immersed. Baptizo means immersed. You see, for Jesus himself was fully immersed with God, but he was also fully immersed with humanity. And I believe this passage that we just read is an example of that, a perfect example of that, that though he was fully God, Jesus was also fully human. And so Jesus is fully immersed with humanity. And that that begs the question this morning, so Jesus is fully immersed with humanity, but are we fully immersed with Jesus? In our daily lives, are we fully immersed, fully covered and immersed with the Savior, the one and only Son whom God gave to the world that he loves. You know, church, when I, when I read this passage from Matthew this morning, I'm reminded of my own story of my first baptism. Now, when I say that, I, I don't mean that I've been baptized a whole bunch of times and I'm, I'm recalling the very first time that I was baptized. What I actually mean is that I, I'm recalling the first time that I that I got to do a baptism for someone else as a pastor, the first time that I performed somebody else's baptism. I was, on, I was on staff at a church, a previous church, years ago, and it was my first, first time, that an opportunity to get to baptize somebody else. And, and I got to meet with this, this person beforehand, about a month beforehand, and it was this little older lady in about, eh, it's probably in her 70s, and I remember the conversations beforehand. I should have known from those conversations that my first performance of a baptism was going to be an interesting one because I'll never forget one of the questions she asked me beforehand when she said, hey, is there any way I can do this that I can be baptized without my hair getting wet? And I, and I, I sat there and I pondered on it. And, and this, is, this was just like we do it here at Bridgeway where it was like full immersion into the water. Like we as the pastors, like we dunk a person down. They go underneath. They go beneath the surface of the water. And then we pull them back up, right? And so I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, ah. I finally respond to her and I go, I feel like that would be pretty impossible. <laughs> if, you're, if you're wanting to get baptized, it's going to be pretty hard to do it without getting your hair wet. And I'll never forget her response. She goes, oh, no worries, no worries. I'll take care of it. And I remember thinking to myself, what does she mean by take care of it? <laughs> like I assumed in that moment, I assumed that she meant like, oh, you know what? I'll mentally prepare and be ready to get my hair wet that morning, right? And so finally you fast forward to the, the day of the service, our baptism service when she's getting baptized and I'm gonna baptize her and I'll never forget 
when it was her time to be baptized and she finally walks up to the baptismal and lo and behold, she showed up that morning wearing a shower cap to protect her hair. And in that moment, I remember thinking, you know what, this is okay. That's all right. You know what, We're, I'm still going to dunk her. She's still going to go under the water and come back. Whether the shower cap stays on or not, who knows. All, all I know is that we're going to be good because I know I, I have confidence that she's going to remember that all she's got to do for me is make sure that she gives me an anchor, that she crosses her arms like so and gives me an anchor to help lower her into the tub and pull her back up from, right? And so shower cap or not, this is going to be great. And so she, she gets into the baptismal. I help her in. She gets to her spot. She sits down. I ask her a few questions, and she says, yes, I believe in Jesus, and I'm ready to be baptized. And it comes to that moment where I say, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I go to lower her into the tub, and it's in that moment when one of those arms comes uncrossed, and it reaches over to the side of the baptismal, and she plants it right there with this kung fu over my dead body grip on the side of the tub. And she turns and looks directly into my eyes, and it's in that moment when I knew that my first baptism had become a battle of wills. <laughs> and as I look back at her, I go, this is going to, I think to myself, this is about to be really interesting. And as I go to lower her in the tub, it had become a battle. And she's fighting back, trying not to go underwater. And so I'm now in this moment of what do I do this lady who wants to be baptized feels like she doesn't want to be baptized in this moment. And so I'm trying to lower her down into the baptismal, all the while she's hanging on for dear life. And I finally get her down to the point where just her face is above the water and she's staring directly into my eyes with the most intense look. And I think to myself, this is as far as I can go without making it look like I'm trying to murder my grandmother. And I finally am able to pull her back up and out of the water and the church celebrates and she looks at me like we're done here, right? Right? And I remember thinking to myself, that could not have been any more interesting. But she was baptized, or at least I think it counts, <laughs> right? I believe that it counted that morning. And church, I got to tell you, I got to tell you this. Uh, I, I think this story, it would have been perfect for you as the listeners, because it probably sounds like it's embellished or exaggerated a little bit. It, but I got to tell you, as the listeners this morning, this, this story would have been perfect for you if only I had a picture to prove it. Oh, <laughs> I do. And so here, like you can see the kung fu grip right here and the shower cap right there. And, I, and I, somehow I'm smiling through this, I think because I knew pictures were being taken, but this is what I got to say this morning, church. Like, it was an interesting experience. And I show you this picture not to, not to say anything bad about this lady and her baptism. I, I, I love this lady. She was fantastic. We had more conversation afterwards. And I know that she's saved. And I know that she was baptized that morning. It just made for an interesting first baptism for me. But when I look at this picture... When I look back at this story and I look at this picture, I think to myself, isn't that just like me? Not, not the actual me, but I look at this and I go, isn't that just like me? Isn't that like us? That Jesus desires us to be all in on him, and yet we're holding back pieces of ourselves from him. That there's parts of us that we're still holding on to, we're holding on to the way that it used to be before we met Jesus. Or maybe we're holding on to the way that we used to be before we met Jesus. And as people, we can be slow. We can be slow and reluctant to give all of ourselves over to Jesus because we can be, we can be slow to trust. Maybe, maybe this is you this morning. Maybe you feel like you've been burned by 
by your trust before. Maybe you feel like you've been burned when you trusted Jesus before. And so this time, you're gonna hold on to that part and you're not gonna let go. And yet, church, I gotta tell you this morning, I I recognize this, I know this to be true, that Jesus isn't just asking for a part of us. He doesn't just ask for one part. He wants it all. And some of us have been holding on for dear life, holding on to things like our finances or a relationship or an addiction or a career or a mistake or a decision or a grudge. And we're holding on like, you know what, Jesus, you can have like 90% of me, Jesus, when it comes to us, but no, 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 you can't have that. I'm not giving that over, God. That's for me to figure out. That's for me to handle. That's for me to deal with on my own. That's not something I'm willing to talk about even though it eats away at my brain. That's not something I'm proud of. That's mine. It's not yours, Jesus. Do we try to deter Jesus because we think we know a better way? Do we try to deter Jesus because we have guilt and shame? Do we try to deter Jesus because we're not willing to let go? All the meanwhile, Jesus is sitting there saying, I want that too. I want that part of your life as well. And I need you to trust me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. Meaning this, that even though we are not Jesus and we can never be Jesus, and we are striving to be like him. And if we're not striving to be Christ-like, then what are we striving to be? And if we're not striving to be Christ-like in all areas of our lives, then what do those areas allow us to become? Is it more like Jesus Or is it something further and further and further from him? See, God didn't give his one and only son so that we could follow him with the convenient parts of our lives. He gave us his one and only son because he knew that we needed all of him and that it would take giving all of ourselves back. You see, I believe this. I believe that it's key to reflect on this because I know that I personally don't wanna leave anything on the table when it comes to my relationship with Jesus, that I don't want there to be any stone unturned in my life. And if that's the case, that means sacrifice. I've gotta be willing to allow my life to be washed over in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and washed over in the name of the Holy Spirit because church, that's what Christianity looks like. It's denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following Jesus every day, even when it's ugly and even when it's difficult. You see church, I'll be the first this morning, I'll be the first to raise my hand and admit that I'm not perfect at it that I'm not perfect at this. And that's why I need Jesus so badly. I do. That's why we need Jesus so badly. So church, together this morning, I wanna, I wanna do this. I, wanna, I want to get vulnerable this morning. Now, and I want to ask ourselves a few questions as we reflect on this. And so I'm gonna ask the worship team to to come forward and get ready to to lead us in worship as we ask ourselves these questions. But here's the first question that I wanna ask us, I want us to ask ourselves this morning. It's this, what's stopping you from giving all of yourself to God? What's stopping you from giving all of yourself to God? Whether it's baptism or or it's something else that we've talked about, what's got you holding on for dear life instead of trusting the arms of the creator? I I think we do this a lot, church. I think we hold on and we're we're not willing to relent or let go. We're just like, no, that, that thing right there, I'm gonna keep that in the palm of my hand. Church, there's gotta be a reason you haven't let go yet. There's gotta be a reason you're still holding on. Is it fear? Is it distrust? Is it anger? What is your reason? 
And then once you've asked yourself this question, then I think we gotta ask ourselves this next one. What is that specific thing that you're holding on to? What is it? What's holding you back from a life fully embracing the power of Jesus and fully immersed in who he is? What's something you weren't meant to keep holding on to that Jesus is more than capable of carrying for you? Is it something that you've, had, that you've held on to for a long time? Is it something that's had its hooks in you for a while? Maybe it's something new, and because it's so recent, it's raw. Recognize what it is, church, and call it out. Don't back away further from it. Own it. And then when you've asked yourselves these two questions, I think we come to the third question, which is this. Are you willing to let it go and let God handle it? Are you willing to finally let it go and let God handle it? If we're to become fully immersed with Jesus, and we've got to relent when it comes to this. We've got to surrender this at the throne of the king and know that he's got a much better plan for it than we ever could because Jesus was given to this world to take on the, world, the weight of the world's sin. And he bore all of that for us on the cross. And so whatever your thing is, he can bear that too. He can bear it too. And then when we find ourselves in the position of doing so, of, of letting go and trusting God with it, then we can simply celebrate and be thankful. Thankful that God sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Church, I think there's no better way for me to wrap up this morning than than to read the latter part of our passage one more time. And so I'm gonna look one more time at the latter part, Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, and they say this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, as soon as Jesus was fully immersed, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said this, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Let me pray for us, church, as we continue to worship together. Father God, this morning, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that you sent your one and only son for my sake, for our sake. God, that in the, in the moments where we're not willing to let go, you said, listen, I, I've, already, I've already completed and established that I'm victorious. And so God, my prayer this morning is that we remember that, we realize and recognize that you're victorious over all. You're victorious over everything. God, that there's nothing in our lives that you don't already know all the details of. God, there's nothing in our lives that we should be holding back because you said, listen, I want that from your life too. God, thank you for the fact that you come into our lives and you say that there's no weight that you should be carrying that I can't handle for you. God, my prayer this morning is this, is that we recognize that in order to become fully immersed in who you are, that we have to be willing to sacrifice those parts of us that we just wanna hold on to the way things used to be. God, that we wanna hold on to the way we used to be before we knew you. Yet, God, you're calling us to let go. And so, God, my prayer this morning is this, is that we can do that. And my prayer this morning is that is if, there's, if there's anybody in this room, God, that, that has something that they know they need to let go of, my prayer is that they would just simply on their laps put out their hands in a posture, in a posture that says, God, I'm open. With palms open up toward the ceiling, God, would we just pray this morning and say, God, I'm willing to let go. I'm willing to let you have that thing. I'm willing to let you do with that thing what, you have, what you've, you've known you can do with it. And God, I'm going to be thankful and celebrate the fact that you are big enough to handle it. God, that's my prayer this morning, that, that we would just be open to the ways that you've said, hey, I've got this. I'm Lord of your life and I'm already victorious. God, as we hand those things over to you this morning, I am, I'm thankful and I'm celebrating. God, may we celebrate that you're the king, that you are the king 
and that we can come to your throne and say, you know what, I'm not perfect. And, and God, this is for you. I'm, I'm gonna give all of myself to you. And so God, as we fully immerse ourselves, we strive to fully immerse ourselves in you and who you are, God, will we be thankful and celebrate. So God, we do just that this morning. As we get ready to worship you more and worship the name of Jesus, the great and holy name of Jesus. And it's in that name that we pray and worship. Amen.